I recently made a video on the ideal CI-CD pipeline and received a ton of feedback from viewers. The comments made me realize that there's no one-size-fits-all pipeline that works for all companies and all application types. My view of ideal is something that worked well in my past experience, but is by no means the only way of doing things. So feel free to adapt this to your preferences. With that being said, there are some additions that folks called out, and that's exactly what I want to talk about in this video. So extra things that I think you can add to this pipeline to make it even better. So this is the previous version of the pipeline from our previous video. And just as a really quick recap, we had a source step where we required a certain number of reviewers. We had a build step, which included all the compilation, the unit tests, and the code coverage checks. We had a test environment that ran our integration tests. Then we had a production one box environment. Now one box is a term that I use, but some folks let me know that the correct term is in fact a canary release. And this step is just kind of a progressive deployment step where we only deploy to one host in our production environment. And this included some checks in terms of alarms, uh, bake period, anomaly detection on error counts and latencies. And then I also had a canary step here, which is actually just a kind of a periodic health check on the state of the system. Once it's ready, it goes to the production step. All right, so that's a really quick recap. Now, in terms of the things that I think we should add to this pipeline, um, the first one is for the local development step. And this includes static code analysis. Now, there's a couple main pieces for static code analysis. There's reliability, there's maintainability, and then there's also vulnerability. So there's many tools that are available for this type of thing. I think the most popular one is probably SonarCube, which a lot of people were suggesting. Now, SonarCube is something that uh, you can integrate in your development environment, or you can also add it as a step, possibly in your build step over here. Now, I actually encourage you to think about adding both of them. Now, the reason I would suggest to have it in your development step is that if you run it against your local software as you're making changes, and it tells you that there's some kind of issue, you have a very quick feedback loop. You're able to address that really quick. If you don't come to know about that issue until you know the build step, or even when it's deployed to the test environment, then you're gonna have to come back to your source, make the change, and then repeat the process again. So I think there's value in running code analysis on your source as you're making changes to your code. And in addition, having it as part of a gate here in your build step, just in case someone forgets to run it as part of their local development. And so you'll have an additional check uh, that runs on your pipeline that'll make sure things don't get to your uh, test or your production environments unless they've succeeded. So a lot of people use SonarCube and have had some great success with it. Uh, since I primarily do Java, I have a kind of a different opinion here. Uh, we use check style, which is kind of similar in terms of style and formatting of your code and giving you warnings directly in your IDE. And in addition, we use find bugs as part of the local build step here uh, that to tell us if there's any kind of code smells or anything like that. Similar functionality to SonarCube, but just a different option available to you. All right, so the next thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, and this one is a little bit debatable, is in terms of unit testing and end-to-end -end testing. Uh, so in the previous video, I talked about running your unit tests in the build step. Now, it was an oversight of mine, I should have mentioned as well, that you should also be running your unit tests as part of your local development, um, in addition to having them here on the build step of the pipeline. Now, obviously, you want to be sure that your code is working as you intend uh, during the development process, so it doesn't make sense to become aware that something is broken after you commit it and push it. Uh, so you definitely want to be running your unit testing without a doubt in your local environment before you send it out for your peers to review. Now, the debatable one is in terms of integration or end-to-end -end testing, whether or not it's worth it to run that on your local environment or wait for it to hit your test environment over here. Now, in my opinion, it is worth it to run it here because it gives you an additional check to make sure that your software is working as intended. However, some feedback that people gave was that it takes too long to run it as part of your source step and it's better fitted for your testing environments over here. However, when I'm developing, I like to be sure that things are working exactly as they're supposed to be working. So I prefer to run that as a kind of a, an additional step before I commit it and get peer reviewed. Uh, I run the end-to-end -end test on my local machine as well. Again, no one size fits all, but just something for you to consider here. All right, so the next thing that I wanted to talk about was in terms of deployments. Uh, so one thing that I talked about briefly in the previous video is having uh, regional stacks here. So a North America stack, an Australia stack, and an EU stack or a Europe stack. And the idea was that uh, a lot of applications break up their software into different stacks for different parts of the world. 
And some people had the feedback that, you know, if you have this kind of setup and you have a linear pipeline like this, that's working through all the different stages, it's going to take forever to get for your software to get through uh, all the different regional stacks, all the different environments and the one boxes and onto production. Very, very valid point. And so one thing that you may want to consider is parallel deployments, which is something I, I think I briefly touched on, but I just want to emphasize it here. Now, parallel deployments allow you to deploy to multiple different regional stacks all at the same time. So for example, after you go through all the gates here as part of your build, uh, you have three different test environments, one for NA, Australia, and EU. You can deploy to all these different regions at once. Now, this is totally fine for tests and even pre-prod environments because there's no one really using or should be using your application in these test environments beyond just developers or QA people. Now, I don't suggest to do this in production environments. And the reason that I don't suggest that is because if you deploy to all three different regions all at once in production, then that means that if there's a bug in your software or something that passed through all these checks that was unanticipated, you're going to have global impact for all of your customers all around the world. So the way that I prefer to do this is to launch in a progressive manner through these different stacks. So I would probably in the production environment go to the lowest volume stack, so maybe AU to start and then to the second highest one, so to EU in this case, and then maybe to North America. Again, this depends on how your traffic is distributed across your stacks, but this is just a suggestion from my experience and a way to minimize your blast radius. However, for the test environments, it makes perfect sense to do this um, in a parallel way so that you can get that software out quickly. All right, so the next one that I wanted to talk about, um, some people criticize that we have a test environment here that goes directly to production. I did talk about this in the previous video, but I just want to reiterate, this is probably a bad idea for most people. Something that you should probably consider is having an extra stage here. Um, so having an extra stage between your test and your prod environment uh, could be called pre-prod or whatever name that you want to give it. And this could be used to run like system tests or possibly be a QA environment for your QA developers to be testing your software before it goes out to production. For small applications, you may not want to have an extra step here, but for something that needs to be a little bit more robust, then I think uh, it makes sense to have an extra stage here for stability and testing purposes. Purposes. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is in terms of deployment options. So in this example, we have that linear deployment style where things are kind of making their way through the system in a progressive kind of way. Now, there are some different options here that I think are worth talking about. And the one that's probably the most popular is this notion of blue-green deployments. Now, if you haven't heard about blue-green deployments before, there's a really good article by Martin Fowler. And um, there's a image here that I wanted to talk about that he uh, references on his article that I think uh, we can use to understand how blue-green deployments work. Uh, so this is an image pulled off his website and the idea with blue-green deployments is that we have basically two identical versions of infrastructure. We have a green one like we can see here and we have a blue one like we can see here. And we use a router to basically point the customer traffic to either one of these different clusters, either the green or the blue. And say our current traffic is being serviced by the green cluster right now. In our blue, we would be getting ready for a new software deployment. So we would load all of our software onto this cluster over here of machines. We would do our QA tests. We would do uh, any sanity checks from our QA team, et cetera, et cetera. Once all that's validated, we basically update the router to start pointing to the blue. So in this case, now the traffic starts getting directed to the blue and the green basically becomes in standby mode. Now there's a whole bunch of benefits for using something like this. I think the, the one that stands out to me is in terms of rollbacks. In the previous example, like we saw over here, from what I was suggesting, if you know your, your software hits the production environment over here and oh crap, I need to roll it back because there's some kind of problem, um, this can take a considerable amount of time, especially if you have a lot of hosts in your production environment. Typically you only um, roll back or deploy to your hosts in a kind of progressive manner. So 33% of the time is pretty much the standard, um, which will take a while, right? Because deployments can take several minutes for each host and you have to do it step by step. So it can take a while for your software to be completely rolled back. However, if you use this blue-green deployment style, all you have to do is just change the pointer on the router. So if you make a mistake and you want to switch from green to blue, you just update your router and now you're servicing all your traffic from the blue cluster. But some of the drawbacks is that you need to have an identical set of infrastructure, so this can cost extra and be more overhead for your application. So blue-green deployment is something that's pretty popular, something you may want to consider and is an alternative to what I suggested up here.
All right, the next thing I want to talk about is in terms of infrastructure. Um, so some people were asking where our infrastructure should be deployed here. Now, a lot of people are using infrastructure as code these days, which I highly suggest. And for those of you that are using AWS, I do have a video of using CDK pipelines to create a infrastructure pipeline to hold stuff like your Dynamo tables, your Aurora databases, that kind of stuff. However, I did want to call out that I think there is value in having a separate pipeline for your infrastructure. So maybe you want to have a pipeline that looks a little bit something similar to what you have here in terms of setup. However, it would be dedicated to managing your infrastructure. And the reason I think that's valuable is that there's a lot of cases where you want to maybe upgrade your infrastructure or upgrade your, I don't know, configuration on your infrastructure without having to deploy it through the main software pipeline. So say you have a bunch of, you know, actual code changes for your software application staged in your pipeline and someone needs to make a, I don't know, maybe a schema update to your database then you don't want to have to deploy that software at the same time as making that infrastructure upgrade. So I do think that there's value in having it separate and it's something that you should consider. So I think that's about it for the amendments that I wanted to make to this. If you have any other suggestions or feedback, please let me know. And thanks so much for watching.